It's refreshment time, folks. I have to return some videotapes. Are either one of these any good? I don't watch movies. Do you like scary movies, Sydney? You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. I don't need a TV. Books, records, films, these things matter. Call me shallow. It's the fucking truth. Over 1,600 titles. Each for rent at just $2 the first night and only a... I don't watch TV. Yeah, but you are aware that there's an invention called television, and on this invention they show shows, right? Tonight on Six Ed World. Okay, I want channels 18, 24, 63, 187, and weather channel. Welcome to the Frog Brothers Podcast with your hosts, Justin and Alec. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 3 of the Frog Brothers Podcast. Uh, we just want to thank you guys for listening and remind you that we do have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, we'll be uh, uploading exclusive content to YouTube pretty soon, actually, so uh, be sure to subscribe, follow, and like all the pages and stuff. You can find us on Spotify, Twitch, or Apple Podcasts, YouTube, like I said. And if we aren't on uh, your preferred listening method, let us know and uh, we'll look into it and we'll do our best to get added to it. Um... How you been doing this week? I uh, can't complain. Uh, had a pretty damn good week. I got a custom painting in this week from Jacob from the YHS podcast. He did a Jurassic Park painting for me, uh, Dilophosaurus and stuff. So check that out on my Instagram at Mr. West Studios. Uh, you can probably find that. I got some stuff tagged in there. All my collections and all that nerd stuffs on there. So check it out. Yeah, that painting is awesome. Also, I got some other. Prince framed finally, so did I. I went to the store and went frame crazy and uh, stimulated my framing business. So I still had some prints from FanFest that I hadn't gotten framed up yet, so I got all those knocked out and ready to go, ready to hang on the wall. Sick. Good stuff. What'd you get? Yep, and then my old... What did I get? Yeah, what did you get in uh, the mail this week? Oh, the mail this week. What did I get? got a Fright Rags blind bag that I ordered, so they had some shirts and pins on sale. So I got a pretty badass Ash vs. the Evil Dead shirt. So it's like a cartoonized version of Ash, and it's got his car on there, and it says Hail the King, baby. Oh, nice, yeah. Also got a couple of pins. One of those is a Creep Show pin, and then the other one was a uh, Teen Wolf pin. None of that MTV crap. We're talking the real fucking Teen Wolf. <laughs> the Michael J. Fox motion picture extravaganza so i got a dancing pin there from the prom scenes where he's got his uh suit on and his hands dance and wiggle around it's pretty cool Oh, nice so that's it for this week uh i think that's it this week still waiting on a few other things to ship yeah i haven't got anything uh i think pretty soon here i'm gonna have to go and get those the trap and pke and the RGB figures they have at Walmart. Yeah, keep your eyes out for that. So I went to Walmart today and checked for that. Um, they didn't have any uh, of the Ghostbusters stuff at my Walmart. I know somebody in our group, our Midland Empire Ghostbusters, found one in the Springfield, Missouri uh, Walmart down there, but no luck up here yet. But I've got the figures pre-ordered. But what I did find in the toy aisle on clearance was some Scooby-Doo 50th Anniversary figures. So I got the Mystery Machine and a uh, Scooby, or not a Scooby, but a Shaggy and a Ghost set. And then I also have the uh, Playmobil Scooby I bought a while back, but I'll be giving that to the kids. So I know that new Scoob movie's delayed, but I read them some books earlier that kind of cover uh, some Scooby-Doo stuff. So just kind of bring that on to the next generation. I know that was one of my favorites growing up. So I fucking love Scooby-Doo. Definitely fun stuff. I, uh... Scooby-Doo, Blood Where Are You, Scoob. the original series. I think that's one we're going to end up covering someday in uh, episode by episode. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. The original series Blood is only like... Lots of yes, have some podcast. <laughs> like G Scoob. So now that we're done screwing around, so you didn't do anything exciting this week, just pretty much sat around on your butt and hung out and played with dogs and... Yeah, flicking the old bean, you know. Uh... Not really doing much. Uh, I dyed my hair blue because, you know, I'm having an existential crisis during the apocalypse. My sleeping has become erratic to the point where this is my, like, 
I mean, I've been up for like five hours now. That's it. And we're recording this at 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night right now. So. And you've been up for five hours? What the hell's wrong with you? That's what I'm saying. I I feel like that meme that they share of, uh, from Rugrats, Stu, the dad, and he's just like, she's like, why are you up making and putting it five in the morning or something? And he's like, because I've lost control of my life. Uh, it sounds that's, like it. Good lord, that's crazy. Yeah, so I'll stay up till like seven in the morning, and then I set my alarm for like two in the afternoon, thinking I'm gonna get up and do things today. And just that just shows you, two p.m. in the afternoon is getting up and doing things right now for me. So, and uh, by doing things, you mean eating and going to the bathroom, and no, like then going back upstairs and sitting on your ass. No, I do that at night. I do that plenty at night, but during the day, I try to. Well, but you know, try to. I'll get the yard work done. There's a big lawn to mow, and uh, I'll do anything like that. I'll try to do the dishes and stuff. Try to do some cleaning and productive stuff during the daylight hours, but... You're just living your best sad dad life then? If you guys haven't seen it, Alec also has a YouTube channel called uh, Black Candle Media. No, it's called Black Candle TV. Black Candle TV, sorry. Incorrect. But he has a, a skit on there he calls Sad Dad doing some silly shit. So uh, check it out. It's pretty funny. And anytime he says he's mowing the lawn, I just think of this skit now. So it cracks me up. So if you want to see some crazy, crazy stuff, go check that out. Yeah, that's what you do when you're having a crisis. You just start producing a lot of content. <clears throat> but hey. Well, some people go in the reverse of that and just disappear into the abyss <laughs> so at least you're channeling some energy you get that manic energy here now that we're in spring so oh yeah that combined with uh having therapy for the first time in my life starting earlier in this year and starting antidepressants anti-anxiety medications greatly helping uh it helps to talk about things like that and openly so yep just got to own it, man. Self-care is a beautiful exactly. thing. Exactly. takes a while for that. I had some some own issues myself before, kind of worked through those, and yeah, no longer going to let anyone shame me for the shit that I didn't ask for growing up or experienced in my life, and not going to let that shit define me, and just got to do your best to keep on keeping on and overcome that crap, so yeah. proud of you for taking care of yourself there. Shit's not easy. So. Right. It's, um, well, we, we had a... A really good time at the Ghostbusters Fan Fest last year. We went out there and saw each other for the first time in like five years, which we talk on the phone all the time still, but, you know, and, and interact on social media, all that stuff, but it's still not the same as seeing someone. We saw each other for the first time in five years out there, and then uh, at one point we were like, you know what, we should, I think that's when we first said, you know, we should start a podcast someday, and... uh yeah, I think we started uh, talking about it back then and just really realized, like, hey, this is something we could do that'd be a lot of fun. We got definitely a unique perspective on it, you know. I'm kind of the older, seasoned, experienced person, but you've still seen a lot of shit that I haven't, so... Yeah. I'd say we kind of balance each other out on our our knowledge here. Yeah, man, I'll, I'll just go in waves. I'll see one movie, and then I'll be like, oh, shit, I have to read about everything about that movie. And then if it had a really good score, I'll be like, what else has is, is this fucking guy scored? If I liked an actor or actress, I go see what else they're in. And if I am interested in anything they're in, I'll watch it pretty much. So uh, That's pretty awesome. So we'll get to more on film scores later. That's in our top five. So we're going to do a little foreshadowing there for you. We'll be talking top five a little later tonight. <laughs> so uh, let's move on, though. Let's uh, hit up the episode by episode. We now return to the real Ghostbusters. Diane, 11.30 a.m., February 24th. Entering the town of Twin Peaks. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Bill Murray is the funniest man on the planet. Episode by episode. So on this week of episode by episode, we cover Extreme Ghostbusters, episode three, The Face of a True Monster. So one thing about this episode, series that distinguishes itself from the real Ghostbusters immediately is the content that they go into, right? So um, you open up with the cold opening here and you see some guys vandalizing um, vandalizing a synagogue and somebody spray painting the words go home on there and then uh, a monster gets one of these guys named Kevin. So apparently we don't like guys named Kevin. Yeah. Because he's a racist jerk. Yeah, I was actually... 
I forgot that that's the way this episode opened, and I was kind of shocked immediately, like, oh, shit. Hey, that's pretty fucked up. And then the ghost comes, and you're like, huh. Yeah, that's a classic move, though, that horror movies used to do, is they make the character an asshole so that you, when, when they're fucked up, you're not feeling bad about it. You're like, oh, yeah, fuck that guy. Yeah, exactly. It immediately gives you the chance to say, okay, we don't like this guy, so here's what's going on, right? He's obviously, his moral compass is fucked. Yep. So we're, we're already okay with what's going to happen to him here as he gets victimized by this clay-looking ghost thing. Yeah. And then you do the regular episode intro, right? So classic uh, Redux version of the rock and roll extreme Ghostbusters. So you get that whole you get that whole tune through through your head and you get to sing along if that's your sort of thing. Yeah. I try not to sing along too much because it's uh, not quite as catchy as the original version. So. No, it sounds like... Uh... A bad new metal band. But, like, there's parts of it that are really fucking good. <laughs> and then some parts where you're like, oh, cut this out. But... Yeah, there's definitely... It's definitely a mixed bag on there. So after the cold opening there, and then you get the credits, then you go into a hospital, right? And outside of the hospital, you see the Ecto-1s parked out there next to an ambulance. And then it kind of cues inside, and uh, you see what's going on in there. So you see those two victims, the two clay victims there that were at the opening. And uh, shenanigans go on. They talk to the doctors. Eduardo realizes that, like, if he just peel the clay off, it, like, flings itself at him and then, like, just kind of makes a muddy mess on the wall, which is kind of interesting to see. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of the pink slime in Ghostbusters 2, but also the symbiote suit and Spider-Man just kind of, like, trying to cling to him. Yep, and then, of course, you get classic Eduardo being a butthead in here. So he looks over at Kylie, and he's like, why don't you try some of that on your face to clear up your pasty complexion? And you're like, oh, shit, zing. Right. So he's so obviously you learn that Eduardo flirts by being a jerk. He's, yeah. Which, you know, there's... They call that negging. Classic. <laughs> nice. It's dumb as hell. They do it in uh, It's Always Sunny and other shit, you know, you... You bring the woman down so she feels bad about herself, so she feels like she could date someone like you. I don't know, there's some shitty asshole logic behind it. But it's garbage and we don't endorse oh, nice. it. No, but it's funny to see it portrayed just because you can like laugh at the humor of what that really looks like because you really realize most respectable women, male or female, probably aren't into like super degrading stuff, right? It's one thing to have like a playful rapport and crack jokes at each other if you know each other, but Yeah. To just start ridiculing somebody you're not really close with is, yeah, that's kind of messed <laughs> up. So you kind of leave out of the hospital there and you see uh, Eduardo, or not Eduardo, you see Roland and Garrett go down by this basketball court. And uh, there's a guy in there playing basketball. And obviously it's the same voice as Roland doing the voice acting. And he like slightly changes the voice just enough that like I didn't even think they cared. Yeah, no. They were and, clearly um, like... Well, this guy's a black voice actor. Let's make him be the black guy at the basketball court. Yep, same thing with the Janine's voice actor uh, on there. Yeah. Goes through and later on is, the, is a newscaster on there, and you're like, they didn't even try to change that either. They just, yeah, they just read. So it's, yeah. it's kind of like in the background or not prominent or a very long role. They're like, eh, just just record this anyway. Yeah, well, uh, they have Billy West do it, and I can still tell it's Billy West, but, you know, people who don't know extensively about him maybe not can tell all the time that he's doing it because he's a real real professional crazy voice actor billy west but still he at least tries yep so apparently uh one of these guys playing this basketball games they're doing some like street hoops gambling and recognizes garrett and he's like makes a joke he's like i'll beat you guys even with a handicap guy yeah knowing that he knows Garrett. So him and Garrett go in there and school these two guys and make a bunch of money off it. And it's like apparently some old friend of Garrett's that he used to run around the town with. So that kind of overlays the whole episode of like Garrett running to some old guys that he knows and like what his old friend's up to now. Yeah, it's kind of like that old trope of uh, swindling at the pool table and shit. But they change it up a yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Yep, like a pool shark hustling. Yep. So then you cut into the uh, firehouse and they're still doing some research on the uh on this mud monster or clay monster right yeah one of the things that i thought was pretty cool in there so like as you see eduardo sitting on the couch watching tv um as it kind of pans across the room you see an original ghostbusters uniform in a in a proton pack on this 
like trophy case or statue case basically in there. So I thought that was pretty cool. And right. I think that's reoccurring in the episodes there. I, mean, I recall seeing that more than once and like noticing it. So for sure. Um, but then, in, you know, they kind of have their little conversation there and then Slimer takes the TV remote from Eduardo. Who's watching like some music videos of like a metal band and changes it to a cooking show and goes up and starts licking on the TV. <laughs> yeah. Um, it reminded me of Michelangelo kissing the TV in uh, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Oh, I can see that. A little nod there is what I thought. I thought that was a little spoiler, maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. So then they they get all technical with everything, right? So they're like, oh, it's Egon Spangler comes in and he says, it's proto-organic properties. So. Oh, sorry. It is mud. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, Classic Egon Spangler voices. The PKE readings are off the fucking, you know, whatever. <laughs> so that's the only time you see or hear Egon in this episode. He's just got a very brief clip there, right? Just a short one. So he's not as heavily featured in all these episodes. So, I mean, they kind of let the crew do their own thing, and he's just there for some formal guidance from time to time on some of these. So Yeah, I much prefer the episodes where he's a lot heavier involved. Just kind of... I do too, but at the same time, I do appreciate that by the third episode, they're like, okay, we're going to let them have some of their own oh, yeah. room to go out and investigate things. For sure. It's just so then you feels like he's kind of like their boss, basically. So Yeah, so moving on with the episode, you, you move ahead to another night scene outside of the synagogue again, because um, they'd gone there during the day, and they're, they're trying to like get in there and talk to them and figure out what's going on, and uh, the rabbi there doesn't want them in, so you know they wind up leaving, come back at night. And then they make Eduardo climb the fence. And so they want him to go get a sample of that mud, which he does. But then the uh, clay monster comes out, which um, later on, Kylie identifies as being a golem, is what they called him. Yeah. Proto-organic so, clay, they call it before that. Yeah. So the, the rabbi was being a jerk about the ancient scrolls and all that stuff so oh, exactly that's when you know that the ancient scrolls that he said that just got here last week oh the same time that your synagogue was vandalized which that's a coincidence but that's when the kids were attacked there so it's obviously linked to the ancient scrolls that's kind of like that hint yeah you, you and you circle back to that later right that becomes more important later yeah. on so so after all that um you kind of see Ed, uh, Garrett like hanging out with the friends, and they're like doing some weightlifting, right? And then uh, the rest of the Ghostbusters come in and check on him, and like Kylie makes a joke about it stinking like testosterone or something in there when they're all working out, and Garrett kind of like talks some shit on the Ghostbusters, just trying to be all buddy buddy and too cool for school with his friends. Right. And so they're trying to just egg him on because obviously Eduardo's buddy has got a couple of their friends there that he doesn't know, but that's who he's hanging out with. So he tries to get in good with them. And so they go up to this rooftop and they're like, yeah, we've been thinking about, you know, what do they call that? Base diving or whatever. When you just jump off the roof of a building. So you see, uh, you see Garrett put this parachute on and just like jump off the roof of a building. And I'm like, no one really shows you like how a guy with, uh, a handicap, that can't land on his legs, like lands from parachuting down. So obviously they didn't animate that. So sometimes it's one of those things where you're like, you guys really should think, think things through a little bit more when you do stuff like that. I get that they're just trying to show that he's extreme and has like no fears and just does whatever, but right. Seem kind of silly to me that you have a guy that's like, what's he going to do? Wait for you guys to bring his wheelchair back down to him. Kind of asinine. Pretty much. He's just going to sit there. The landing's going to suck too. Cause you can't even like try to control it. You're yeah, but I don't know. <laughs> One of the funny lines from it earlier was uh, when Kylie says uh, one of Eduardo's kind of catchphrases when she says, I am a scientist, man. Oh, yeah, she totally mocks him there, which is good stuff. I like that when they do those little things, right? They carry things over across the series. Yeah, it's hilarious. It was already the third episode, and he's being mocked for it, though. It's funny as hell. So then after they do the skydiving scene, then they say, hey, man, you think he's cool to do anything else? So then you see them going, hey, we're going to go get some revenge. So then you see him pull back up in front of the synagogue again, and you know they start breaking windows and just all around messing things up over there, breaking things, getting into it. But Garrett you know, obviously has more of a conscience than that, so he kind of gets into a fight with them and says, hey, like, hey man, like that's not right. And then they throw him out of his wheelchair and like make fun of him, and then they, you see them 
riding around in his wheelchair while he's crawling around after him while they're breaking things, which eventually Gollum comes in and starts messing with them. So just as uh, Garrett's about to be attacked by Gollum, I believe the Ghostbusters show up and blast his arm off. Yeah. And then Eddie comes and helps him back into his chair, and he says, what are you doing here? And he's like, a uh, long story. So, you know, they kind of don't get into all that. Right. Oh, so one of the other pop culture references in there from Eduardo that I thought was pretty good that I took note of was uh, when the thing keeps growing, right? Eduardo says, um, I'd say we let Gumby wail on him. And they're basically referring to as they're trying to fight this thing. Yeah, Gumby. Gollum goes after the other guys, yeah, and so they make a Gumby reference. And I'm like, for the mid-90s, like, I guess we'd get that. But nowadays, like, you're not going to hear a lot of Gumby references in any kind of pop culture stuff. Yeah. I f- Especially aimed at kids, right? Gumby was my shit when I was a kid. Oh, Gumby and Pokey? Yeah, man, that was some fun stuff. I don't even know why I liked it so much. I can't even recall much happening other than Gumby hanging out with Pokey. I think it was just because it was like claymation. It was different than normal animation, and that was one of the few shows you'd see like a different style on there, so it just just stood out. Yeah. So they keep fighting this thing, and then, you know, Garrett tries to help, so they get it into this big building, and Garrett stays behind, and then they wind up blowing the building up, basically, and he comes rolling out, and then Gollum comes back out of there kind of crispified a little bit right so if you're made out of clay and you're around heat you're obviously going to start like you're going to be in a kiln almost so you warm up and he's having a hard time moving it's moving slower yeah so they knock some pipes loose and like break it down into some crusty pieces it starts to soften up and reform and then kylie makes her move she runs and grabs a scroll out of the thing's mouth Saves the day through that because she'd gone and done some research there through, uh, I don't, it didn't show exactly where she was at, but I was assuming she was like in the synagogue, like in the library there maybe or something learning. Yeah, that makes sense. So she got some of the inside information in there and helps, uh, get the thugs arrested, right? So they all come up and, you know, Eduardo, or not Eduardo, but Garrett's friends like, hey man, let's, uh, let's not worry about this. And then he's like, uh, not worry about it. And then the cops show up and he gets, those guys get arrested. So, and then the, uh, rabbi and his, I'm not sure what the younger guy's name was on there, but they come out and they talk to him. And so Kylie hands the rabbi the scroll and he says, thank you. And then he says, you know, there's basically some things that aren't supposed to be messed with. And he basically crushes it, kind of destroys it. So, yeah. And like, you know, they kind of give us, the moral of the story comes directly from the rabbi when he says, you know, we can't fight hate with hate or violence with violence. And, you know, kind of tells that story there that, you know, you got to you gotta overcome when you're facing adversity and you can't resort to what other people are doing, which pretty uh, pretty high-profile stuff there, right? So this episode deals with a lot on racism. It deals with um, being the bigger person there, not letting those things define you, so... Overall, I really enjoyed it, right? It was definitely, a really sets the tonal difference for how the series picks up and going from here, because this is essentially your first episode that's not your intro. Right, and that's what I was thinking. Um, it's very, right off the bat, other than just obviously having the four different Ghostbusters, the first episode is very focused on diversity and stuff. So it's really just, the whole series is like that, but seeing this first one, in this order again and thinking about that it's very interesting it's very good well you see how it's really just setting the future of the series up so i I did enjoy that quite a bit so it was a fun one for sure and then again you know it's got this dark muted color palette there's a lot of night scenes on there so really sets itself apart from real ghostbusters because there's a lot more brighter colors on there and uh happy-go-lucky things yeah i mean the um uh, unofficial title for it originally was ghostbusters dark so uh, that makes sense, you know, because that's kind of where they went with yeah, it. Yeah, the so. tone, the colors, everything is a little bit darker, so it works. With that, I guess Good we'll uh, move on to the next segment. Yeah, so we got a new segment this week. It's called Five Minutes. 
So the thought process behind five minutes is that we'll talk about any topic for five minutes, and then as that timer goes off, we just stop, shut up, end your sentence. You don't even get to finish your sentence. Just move on, carry on, where the whole thing is, is if you want to continue the conversation, hit us up on social media, give us your thoughts. If you got a similar experience, tell us about it so we can understand, see where you're coming from. But we kind of wanted one of those things where you just have a hard cut off to see what happens. So I'm going to get a five-minute timer set here. But just to preface this, we're going to talk about our music history, right? So I'm a musician. Alec is a musician. We both played in bands. We've been in a band together. Done a lot of different things along that. So we'll just kind of get going and bounce bounce some ideas off each other there and just kind of have that conversation. So I know there's probably a lot of musicians that also listen to us. So, you know, what do you guys, what got you guys started on music? What's, uh, what interests you? All right, and I'm going to start the timer now. Why don't you tell me about your music history first to begin with? So what got you into music? Uh, hanging out with your dumbass, uh, mainly. Uh, quickly, I would say, I think it was Christmas I got an album, the first Ramones album from you. And I was like, only pretty much exposed to like, <clears throat> Blink-182 and Korn and other stuff you listen to. But uh, the Ramones album was the first one that really hit home for me. And then I got a bass. And some of the first songs I learned were songs off that album that you helped me learn. So that was the beginning. What about you? Uh, me, you know, so I remember hanging out with some friends in junior high. And I knew a lot of musicians. And, you know, a lot of guys played guitar. And I, I, I knew a guy named Ryan. And... Uh, you know, I was talking to him about thinking about getting a guitar or something. He's like, man, you should get a bass. He's like, I play bass, and he's like, you know, every band needs a bassist. And so you, you should do that, you know, because there's a lot of guys that play guitar, so you'll be able to play with more people that way, you know, because guitar players are a dime a dozen, basically, at that point. So I was like, oh, okay, kind of good advice, I thought. So kind of got into it. I remember I had to haggle with mom and dad over getting a bass for Christmas because like, well, that's really expensive. And I remember driving around and looking at shops and like trying to figure something out right. and negotiating. I was like, well, my birthday is in April, so I'll take this for Christmas and my birthday. And they're like, are you sure you're going to be okay not get anything on your birthday? I'm like, yeah, I'll be fine. So Christmas comes around, I get my first bass. No fucking clue how to play it at all. So I start jacking around with it. I remember I broke my low E string because I didn't even have a tuner at the time, right? So it was just like just jacking around completely 100%. And this is pre-YouTube days or anything like that. So, I mean, you could get on the internet and find tabs, find some real basic stuff there. So I really didn't take it serious for a while. I eventually got another set of strings to replace my low E string with and then kind of went from there. And eventually that summer afterwards, I think I had been working at Dairy Queen for a little while then and uh, went to a local music shop and went and bought a guitar guitar amp and a uh, talked him into throwing me in a free tuner so then I finally had a tuner so it was like okay I got a guitar and a bass and the guitar was really just to screw around with you know it was like just wanting to be able to play a little bit of everything but right still knowing everyone played guitar I focused on bass still so eventually started getting halfway decent at that right yeah I uh, eventually later on I picked up guitar i think when i was 16 so i've been playing bass since i was 11 i picked up guitar at 16 and then a synthesizer also at 16 and then started recording my own stuff in garage band um did that for a number of years and then i also played in a kind of a synthy new wave band called 88 miles per hour is the first band i played shows with like the skate park of memphis and uh a couple other places around town i don't even remember all the places because they're not around anymore but uh then uh, moved to Kansas City later on to play with you guys uh, when I was 18 and Brian and the Humans, which was, uh, I don't know, probably your fucking like fourth band or something like that at least. Uh, I'm trying to think. So like in high school, I screwed around with a few bands, never took them too serious until I was, my friends uh, Joel and Nick were, were finally trying to get a band going. And, uh, you know, I'd written a bunch of punk music by then, so I pretty much had like an album's worth of music written in like a full set's worth of stuff so started playing with those guys and then yeah we practiced like most of my senior year like you know we just practiced and practiced and practiced a lot before we tried booking shows because we'd write a song get it down write a song get it down and kept kept growing the set list yeah 
so that was pretty fun. And then I also started my other band, and that was called Spoiled Solidarity. I also started my other band called Short Changed. Uh, the summer after Spoiled started playing shows, and my friend Josh had moved back from New Hampshire, so kind of back got back with some guys I was jamming with before I was in Spoiled. And then I was playing in, playing shows with two bands for a while, and it was so much fun because short change is more like fast paced street punk pop punk not street punk but i mean skate punk and pop punk spoiled solidarity was like street punk so that was so much fun being able to play all those songs yeah i uh i like i said my first band was kind of new wave synthy stuff so i played guitar had synth and i had, had a bass player with me but it was just us two and then i pretty much wrote and did most of the stuff but he he played bass and we had a drum machine for our drums so that's kind of where I started off. Yeah, and you're a hell of a lot better guitarist than me, so. I don't find clocks on you. Yeah. And that's five minutes, son. Five minutes. So we will carry on. If you got any questions about our music or anything like that, hit us up and carry on the conversation. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. YouTube, throw it in the comments. You know, we'll talk about it anywhere and everywhere. So. So, Another Man's Garbage. This week, Alec chose the movie Drop Dead Fred. It's got a whopping 9% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and a 77% viewer score on Rotten Tomatoes. So this one ranks higher with the viewers, but the critic score is complete shit. This is why it's in another man's garbage. So Alec, can you uh, just get into it? Tell me why you chose this movie and just start going with your thoughts on it. Trump Dead Fred is a classic for me, but not for many. Most people don't know what it is, and I, they may have heard of it, or maybe they saw it once when they were a kid or something, but it has this cult following. Um, clearly, if it has a 77% rating, there's people searching it out to rate it. They know about it, but the critics thought it was a big pile of shit. Um, it has Phoebe Cates, Tim Matheson, Carrie Fisher, and Rick Mayel, uh, who plays Drop Dead Fred. And this is an, another occasion where I'm just perfectly okay watching Phoebe Cates in another movie because I wish I had more movies to watch her in. Because not only Absolutely. is she a great actor, but she is also nice to look at. So, um, Yeah, so this is where we defer here, right? So I was never a fan of this movie growing up. Our older sister liked it, but I never could get into it. Um, so... You know, I me- there's certain things in the movie I remembered kind of having seen before, but watching, and I just like, ugh. And I posted something about this on Facebook, and I had a lot of people surprisingly say, oh, I used to watch that movie all the time. So yeah, clearly that's like that's where that 77% rating comes from, is is younger people that really like certain aspects of the movie, right? So uh, let me kind of cover some of my thoughts on it, and then I'll get yours, because having not watched this a lot as a kid, I got a completely different perspective, and I think most people that have watched this movie think... Yeah. So, you know, I'm kind of watching this, and obviously, you know, you see her being treated poorly by her husband or whatever, and so this trauma in her life causes, like, a relapse to her childhood or childlike state, and, you know, that's essentially when Fred returns to her life and starts making things difficult, so he ridicules her, he calls her, oh, you know, when he sees her, he's like, oh, you're uglier now that you're older. Yep. (laughs) So... Kind of crazy there, and then like one of the scenes I do remember is like him rubbing dog shit like all over the furniture, and like as a kid, like I remember that scene always grossing me out. You know, we grew up with dogs, so like playing in your yard occasionally, you'd like run into dog shit or mowing the yard or whatever. So seeing that, like you immediately have that smell in your head, and you're like, oh, all over your house, like that's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> um, I don't have the disgusting so. feeling towards that. I just. uh Really enjoy that scene. Dog poo on the carpet. Dog poo on the carpet. Yeah, and so then she starts saying, "Hey, you know, uh, do you remember my childhood friend, Drop Dead Fred?" And then, 
you know, the mom's like, no, I don't remember your childhood friend drop dead Fred. Like, oh my, you know, like she's like spiteful of it. So, yeah. So there's some really dark stuff in there, right? So he starts calling her a mega bitch and he says, yeah, we should chainsaw her and slice her into tiny pieces. And you're like, I don't think a lot of kids like get that, like how dark that part is. Like, ooh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no. One of my uh, favorite parts is when uh, they're making mud pies or some shit. And he's like, we'll make her eat up this mud. And uh, no, that's what she says. The little girl says that. And she says, yeah, we'll make her eat up all this mud. And he's like, yeah, and we'll cut her head off. And she's like, with scissors. And he's like, yeah, and we'll make her eat it. And she's like, make her eat her own head? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, with what? And he's like, oh, yeah, we'll we'll eat her head. And we'll poo her out all over the table. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely a dark scene. So that's like some shit, though, that I would say that's just weird and bizarre, though. So yeah, watching this movie, I definitely see the influence of your your abstract like bullshit you talk sometimes is, and you know, it's endearing, but it's also hilarious because sometimes you go on the abstract and it's hilarious. Exactly. Uh, so Fred gets his head stuck in the fridge door. And so, you know, there's this whole, like, played-out scene of, like, him pulling his head out, and then he just looks like the Mad TV cartoon character yeah. for a minute as he gets his head reinflated and everything. And then he's just jacking around in the kitchen while her and her mom are in there, and he looks under the mom's dress and says, oh, there's cobwebs or something. And you're like, okay. Again, another child joke that no one gets there. And you're like, huh, all right. Yeah, but I still laughed my ass off that as a kid. I didn't get it, but it was still, like... I still understood that he was saying there's cobwebs on her vagina. I just didn't understand that why it was funny, but it was still fucking funny. Yeah. You didn't know why it was funny. You just knew it was funny. Exactly. Yeah, so then she goes nuts and, like, runs outside, and then Fred goes out there, and they argue, and... Oh, yeah, well, they go outside because he's saying, like, you do it like the pigeons. (laughs) And then they run out there, and he's, like, chasing the pigeons around, trying to fuck with them. Yeah. And then she gets pissed at him, so then, you know, he goes, you know, she tells him to leave, and so he goes and gets ran over by a fire truck, just leaving his shoes behind in the street, and then you don't see Fred for a few minutes, because there's some other flashbacks for a second, so she flashbacks to being a kid, and her and Fred are playing as burglars, and they are just fucking this house up, man. Like, they're going through trash and everything, like, making all kinds of noise. Uh, one of the things I started noticing at this point is he calls her Snot Face all the time. Like, he has pet names for her that are just, like, derogatory. Like, hey, Snot Face. Yeah, it's hilarious. And it the, just the way he talks just reminds me, it's like, is this like a Sex Pistols biopic? Because this is, like, the way he's talking shit to these little kids and calling them all kinds of names. <laughs> kind of funny. So the parents call the cops instead of looking around the house. Like, a bunch of fucking pansies. Like, go check the house. Like, and they don't even go to check on their fucking kid's room, which pissed me off. Like... No, go check on your kids, then figure out what the hell's going on. Right. And then in the meanwhile, the dad falls down the stairs, hurts himself as the cops show up. So they take him in handcuffs, and Fred talks about parents and about how bad her mom is, right? So he's having some, like, really adult conversations with this little kid about the overall scenario going on there. So Right. And then you end your flashback, and you come to the modern times where mom's trying to help her get over her separation from her husband and so they do like a transformation makeover it's not quite a montage it's just kind of more of a short scene of where they do everything there but she winds up like in the same outfit as her mom has on like same shirt same dress and just new haircut and all that kind of crap yeah that's a bummer winds up getting a letter from her husband with some bullshit in it and whatever (laughs) and then uh you kind of see a few other scenes here so I'm not sure if it's another flashback or not, but I just, like, wrote down that Fred throws a cookie into a fish tank. I thought that was going to come back and be more significant later. (laughs) Because it's like an Oreo, and it's got, like, fuzz all over it, and he, like, blows it off and tries to blow the dust off. Oh, yeah, that's hilarious. And and then you get, like, a Batman 89 reference, where, like, Fred is hanging upside down and sleeping like you see Bruce Wayne sleeping when Vicky Vale leaves. (laughs) So I was like, huh, that's such a strange thing to see in there, but, you know, I'm always looking for those references. They almost, uh, well, they offered Tim Burton to direct this, which is funny. I could see uh, it okay, being that makes sense, a movie then. that he would direct, so. Definitely, I, yeah, there's, because one of the sequences near the end has very Tim Burton, Beetlejuice vibes. Yep. 
Robin Williams was offered Drop Dead Fred, too, actually. Oh, nice. Weird stuff. So then you see that she goes to see her friend Carrie Fisher, and she lives on this houseboat, right? So you don't think much of that at first. She's just there talking and venting and all that. But the cool thing I liked about Carrie Fisher's character was that she was, like, very endearing and accepting of the fact that, you know, she had an imaginary friend, right? She wasn't ridiculing her, like, wasn't talking shit on her mental health. Like, she was just, like, a very supportive friend through the whole movie, really. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool and pretty noteworthy. So Yeah. And then the one thing I did note there, though, was after that was that... Um, I guess they go to another flashback where she's cutting her hair, right? And so wakes up and she's cut her own hair in the current time, right? So she's cut off half the hair again. So she goes through another haircut transformation in this movie. But Carrie Fisher's guy friend there and says something. He's like, oh, I never had imaginary friends, just wet dreams. Yeah. And you're like, okay. Again, like another joke in there that's not for kids, but like the only people I know that truly love this movie and the cult following are people that grew up watching it. <laughs> yeah, I was laughing my ass off when I rewatched it. Because I for, always forget that that line's in there. It's not one that I always remember, but it is once I hear it again, and then it sets me off. <laughs> it's so dumb. Yeah, I yeah, know. that was. There's some definitely some funny ones in there. So then you see her ex go by on the boat, and she waves at him. And like clearly like that triggers her there, right? Because then next thing you know, her and Fred are playing pirates. And they take out this... It's supposed to look like a steamboat style boat, you know, like we've we've actually ridden on boats that kind of look like that down in New Orleans and stuff. So interesting to see that. But then she just decides to take it out for a spin. Yeah, she's trying to chase down Charles. So hilarity ensues. Yeah, she's trying to chase him down and obviously he's in a little speed speedy motorboat and she's in this giant houseboat, so never gonna catch him, but her and Fred manage to fucking sink this ship and she winds up going to Carrie Fisher's work, still soaking wet, like sopping wet, kind of coming in there. You get like the wet carpet sounds, I think, as she like walks in and like calls Carrie Fisher out of a meeting. Yep. And then the funny thing in that I, I liked that line she says, she's like, well, remember your house? Yeah. Uh, it sank. So. Yeah. Which is funny then, because then again, Carrie Fisher's character is like, okay, being super supportive of all this, like in real life, if you sink someone's houseboat, you get your ass beat. Pretty much. Like, right, someone would lose their fucking mind. Not her. She keeps her cool. Then she goes and, you know, realizes that Fred's sitting in her chair in the meeting room, so she goes in and wheels the chair out and has a fucking moment in the hallway where she's acting like she's beating up Fred, but uh, Fred's clearly out of the chair by then. So, like, she's humoring her all the way, and then she has her own Freudian slip, and I'll let you talk on that one. Yeah, she just uh, lets it slip that she's banging the boss. She's complaining about uh, her coming over, and, uh, no, she's complaining about Fred fucking up how she, uh, she gets laid. I just can't remember the exact quote yeah. that she says, but she, you know, reveals that she's fucking the boss, basically, in front of everyone and the boss. Yeah. Because essentially she takes her um, high heel off and, like, starts, bound, you know, banging against the floor, acting like she's beating up Fred, like, with the heel of the shoe. Right. <laughs> And uh, she's making a complete total ass of herself in a scene in the hallway. Everybody comes out of the meeting room and is like, what the fuck are you doing? And she's like, I'm fucking beating this guy's ass. And they're like, there's no one there. And she's like, what are you, stupid? He's invisible. Yeah, that is the beautiful thing, right? Like, how, how can you be so supportive of your friends? <laughs> yeah. And And to me, like, that's one of the subtleties in the movies that... That was one of my favorite moments in the entire movie. It was just, like, her being supportive of that and, like, trying to, like, help her out with that. Yeah. Carrie uh, Fisher rewrote some of her dialogue for this movie. As you may or may not know, she was a very famous rewriter, basically. Did a lot of uncredited work. Yeah, and she work, was also so. one that was... And she was very open about her struggles, her own personal struggles with mental illness and stuff. So, like, to see her be such a, a supportive role there is pretty damn cool, I thought. Oh, yeah. So then, then you move along and you see that they're having, like, she goes out to lunch with this childhood friend of hers that, you know, she caught up with and flirted with earlier, right? So there's a little bit of romantic tension there. You know, they don't play it up a whole lot. You just play it up that this guy really wants to be her friend and, you know, really, like, really missed her or whatever, so. Yeah, he's so they go clearly more interested than her. Yeah, exactly. 
but he gets a he humors her right because a lot of people are like oh you're 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 crazy like i can't handle that so when she starts acting like an idiot and pouring drinks on herself and just destroying this like fancy restaurant out like he just does the same thing with her right he just normalizes her behavior makes her feel okay about it yeah so i thought that was pretty interesting yeah it reminded me of this scene and uh because this scene is one in particular where you can see fred doing things and then you see everybody else's perspective and you don't see fred which they do it throughout a lot of the movie but they do that and it reminds me of the scene in invisible man when she's having uh, dinner with her sister. I won't say much more than that in case you guys haven't seen it, but she's having dinner with her sister, and it's a very interesting scene there. If you have seen it, you know what oh, I'm yeah, talking that's... about. Yep, that's pretty wild. So, she winds up having, like, another public meltdown because, like, there's... You see live music being played, and you see Fred, like, playing a violin and, like, messing things up while... Well, Next thing you know, you obviously see everyone else's perspective again, and she's beating up this other violinist there that's, like, next to Fred, and she thinks she's hitting Fred, but she's hitting this other woman. Takes this, like, nice violin and smashes it on the ground, breaks it. Next thing you know, you see her mom bailing her out of jail and, like, writing a check to cover the cost of the violin. Yeah. That's about the time they go to the mental facility for, uh, like, the children's... uh, children psychologist yeah yeah, you go see dr ryland there is what uh, i noticed there yeah and then you see the other kids which is kind of imaginary friends yeah i thought that was kind of neat that was unexpected to me was you see like all these other young kids with their imaginary friends and just how you know how they're coping with things in there and how well like one of the mothers sees her sitting there and like she says something asinine to her and she just looks like you know she's used to it so she doesn't really pass judgment just says okay Right. Let's it be. So then you see all these other, like, absurd characters kind of come through there, which uh, was kind of fun, but they were kind of short-lived, too. Like, you know, I, I expected more out of those characters, or maybe you'd see them more later, but... I was kind of honestly happy it didn't, because they were... Yeah. It's like one of them no, they just dropped nearly... dead Fred as obnoxious by himself, but I, I like it. But having them all in the same room was just like, all right, move along. Yeah, it... Fit felt like total chaos in there so i was glad they didn't come back later but it was kind of, you know and they didn't get as good at actors in, in those other roles they're just kind of like yeah, you know they more like typecast on how they looked not what they're actually acting right yeah so then she gets prescribed the pills and they uh warn drop dead fred as he's leaving don't let her take uh what is it the green or blue pills the blue ones i think yeah no they're green yes yeah, don't let her take the green pills it'll kill you or whatever yeah It'll basically make you not exist. So. Yep. So then they get to one of your favorite scenes in the movie. So they get home and they've got this like giant, like heavy set, stocky nurse. She's there to help. Right. So, um, you kind of see that and you get that gets going. Like she's in the room. Like, you know, you're kind of trapped in here until we sort this stuff out. Well, then you go to the flashback scene where they're having cereal in the dining room. Right. And knock the cereal box over and starts making a mess of it. And then they trash the dining room. And then, so I I took a note. I said, you know, then they start making these mud mud pies and they fuck shit up. Because, like, they just trash that dining room in there. They always trash everything. It's And it's funny because her mom's clearly the type of person that wants everything pristine. She shampoos the carpets regularly and stuff. She had, I think she had just shampooed him when he smeared the dog poo in that scene, you know. And then she got accused of it the morning after. Yeah, so then... um, Fred gets put in the box and they tape it up, you know, in the flashback scene, right? So this is interesting to me. So the mom does that. Um, the dad saying he wouldn't help, saying it's not right. So then you see him, like, walk out at that point. So and then the mom threatens her. She threatens to throw it away if she touches the box again and goes to clean up the kitchen. So little girl writes Fred a letter um, that he reads to the adult version of her when they come back to the present time. So they're kind of talking at that point in time. That's like when she stopped seeing Fred as a kid, because, you know, she said that's like when she lost all of her spirit and faith and in, in, in Fred. So, um, there's some really powerful stuff in here. Like to me, this is a very depressing moment in the movie because she said she would, um, she never let her mother know how much she could hurt her. She said she, and her mother did it all the time. So she vowed to never show her mother, her real feelings again. Yeah. And so, like, this just shows you, like, 
it's a whole layer of child abuse going on there, just like with the bad way that kids being treated, like mental abuse and everything else, right? The way the mom talks to the kid, the way that she treats her, then the dad leaves, right? So and you kind of circle back to that. Yeah, and she continues to do it throughout her her life. She like yeah, I mean you 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 see that she's clearly like just accepting that that's how her mother is, and just you know still wants to maintain a relationship with her, but. Yeah. Just subjects herself, right? She's been victimized long enough. She just continues to be. Yeah, she's manipulated by her as an adult now. So. Yeah. So then she tries to leave the house, and the nur- the nurse puts her back up in the room. So then, she takes this pink phone that she has in the room and and breaks the window out. After Fred had tried to break out with his head, like he slams his head into it a few times. <laughs> so then he gets picked up by Mickey. That's her uh, uh, boyfriend there. So, Fred is sitting bitch in the middle of the, the truck and he starts emasculating Mickey saying like you know making fun of him for being open about his feelings towards her and <laughs> uh, I don't think you'd see that in a modern movie right I think they'd write that character a different way right but he winds up dropping her off at this gala where she's going to see her husband so the thing about this it's uh you know they walk in there and she looks all nice in her dress and then Fred comes in looking like a fucking troll doll <laughs> he looks Bright amazing hair, like all all up with a little curl on it, so... The only thing it reminds me of is, uh... Dumb and Dumber, the two suits they wear. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too, but the way his hairdo is totally is like, uh, troll balls in there. Or so. Jimmy Neutron, for those of you more my generation. <laughs> yeah. So, she winds up seeing the husband at the party, and then there's, like, an awkward moment where... She's talking to the husband's side piece. I think her name's Elena or Annabella. Sorry, Annabella. Yeah. And they're kind of going back and forth and, you know, kind of almost complimenting each other. And then the husband walks up and, like, starts chatting with Annabella and, like, has an awkward moment when he sees that she's there. So, yeah. So she gets upset. She bounces out on this party and she goes back home with her husband, right? So he picks her up. He smooches on her. Um, the door slams in Fred's face, so. And this word, uh, kind of interesting. They make, start there. making dinner and stuff. Yep. Yeah, they start making a nice dinner, and then I think they wind up going to sleep, right, or whatever. And then you see that. No, no, her the, mom, the whole salad thing that, fiasco. That's that's later on. Oh, okay, though. that's what I was talking about. I couldn't remember if that happened right away or. Yep. No, so this is before. So she's there, and then her mom and the nurse come to get her back, right? Well, Charles doesn't know who it is, so he goes out there and fucking smacks that oh, nurse in the yes. face with a cast iron skillet. He's <laughs> fucking laser out. And the thing is, like, as absurd as this movie is, like, you know, they don't show, like, that would have broken her nose or made her bleed somewhere, but she just passes out is all. Right. So In reality, it would have been, like, a fucking bloody broken nose. <laughs> Yeah, and then they show, like, another layer of the abuse that she's used to getting put through, right? Because as they start making out, he calls her Annabella. Yep. Um, And she's just trying to normalize shit again, so that's what finally convinces her to take the pill. She hadn't taken the green pills yet since she'd got them, but that's that's the scene where she finally submits and takes one. So, meanwhile, you see Fred over there, and he is just taunting her for taking the pill. So, kind of skip ahead, though, to the next day, and... You see her with Carrie Fisher again, and Carrie Fisher's like happier than a pig in shit because she got a huge check written from the insurance for that. And then she says, "Like, who would have thought that a houseboat is worth that much?" <laughs> uh, she must have been given that so, or some shit. I don't know how you don't know how much your own houseboat is worth, but exactly. So then you wind up going to back to their house, and this is kind of where you're talking about. So she's going for that romantic dinner. Yep, and. Um, what winds up looking like normal food turns out to be a mud pie, spills all over her husband's lap. It, to me, it reminded me, like, you ever made one of those homemade volcanoes where it, like, bubbles and spatters and spits everywhere? It's, it's kind of what that looked like besides it. Right. Looked like muddy water that way, so. Muddy waters. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Fred says that Charles is the wrong guy for her, and she takes another pill to try to shut Fred up. And there's one little subtle thing, like anytime she takes a pill, they have like a little special sound effect for it, right? Yep. You know, indicating that it's hurting Fred. Yeah, and he always like acts like it starts hurting him more and more when she starts taking him and stuff. Charles, being the d bag that he is, goes in the other room and like 
storms off acting like he's mad at her and she says you know i'll make you know, i'll make a romantic salad so meanwhile he's in there while she's working on a salad and winds up calling up annabella so fred finds this out and he's just at this point he goes from like antagonist to you start seeing that he's truly looking out for her best interests so he's trying to get her to realize this and finally gets her to like peek through the door to see what the hell's going on yeah and she's so at that point Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, so at that <laughs> point, you know, he's talking to her, so he's in complete, you know, he tells her that he's in complete control of Lizzie, and, you know, Fred's telling her to leave, but then she says she's scared to be alone, right? Which oh, yeah, that shit makes hits so you. much sense to the to the big picture, right? Because you see that she's afraid to be alone, so that's why she puts up with all this bullshit in her life, right? That's why she lets her mom treat her bad. That's why she lets Charles treat her bad. So you get a little clarity on what the hell's going on there. Yeah, it was a really, uh, watching that scene as an adult is, like, heart-wrenching. You're like, fuck. Yeah, it's, you know, that's why I was saying, like, you know, when I told you a little bit, we discussed this briefly before we actually recorded, and I was just saying how this movie is, like, really depressing when you look at it, because some of the shit that goes on and some of the subtleties that you never notice as a kid, because that's not what you're looking for as a kid. Right. So then you get into one of the most Tim Burton-esque parts of this film right where it has a lot of beetlejuice qualities to it just the way it feels the way it looks the way it sounds yep um she basically passes out and falls into fred and they disappear and they kind of go into this surreal version of the house and it's very museum like right you have like little velvet ropes in front of all the things in the house basically saying like hey you're in this house you can't have any fun with it right so then you see charles in there right and He's kind of being a butthead, and she pulls the Jaguar emblem off the hood of the car, the hood ornament off, and the car deflates and spins around and bounces out of the room and, like, shrinks down. So, <clears throat> you know, I said there's some cliche horror music and synthy sounds in there going on, so it's almost like it wanted to be written by Danny Elfman, but they obviously didn't get Danny Elfman, so you're just like, uh, okay. You, you know, they're trying to have that vibe, though. Right. Very different tonal pace from the rest of the movie. Because this is, this is imagination. This isn't a flashback, right? So, it definitely has that Danny Elfman and Tim Burton vibe to it. Where if they had directed and scored it, it probably wouldn't have been that different. Um, I can definitely see it feeling more surreal, like a film like Edward Scissorhands has that surrealist, weird vibe to it. But it's still like in a normal neighborhood ish. But it's you know it, it is what it is. But this definitely has that kind of sure. quality feel to it too. And then, um, what does she see, like a, a tree that grows out of the stairs or something? Is that what that is? Yeah, so Fred's basically working on her, using her imagination. So she imagines a tree grows from the stairs. So um, they go up the stairs, and like they see her mom out there, and her mom comes out and scolds her. And you know they've got like some layering on the mom's voice to make her sound like a demon. And you know she basically says, you know, I'm not afraid of you, and makes the mom disappear. So Fred's here helping her conquer her fears and the things that she's the most afraid of. So, um, then this is one of those things that I think a lot of anyone that's kind of been through some dark stuff in their life as a kid. And then, you, you know, when you start to acknowledge it and accept it as an adult, this is another powerful moment in this movie. So you see the adult version of herself comforting the child version of herself. Oh, and she yeah. unties her from the bed that her mom had her like tied to. Basically she's setting her free from her childhood past that she had no control over. Yeah. Pretty deep stuff on there because you're watching this and it seems really silly, but there's a lot more depth to it when you start looking at it. Yeah. Um, it's that ending you're just talking about. That ending, you know. Well, not it's not the ending, but it is basically the climax and ending. And it's, like you said, it's very moving. It's very uh, relatable in a lot of senses. So, like you said, it's not just a, a ridiculous comedy, which is what I just saw it as as a kid. But you see, it's yeah, I like, think that's how most people view it. It's not even just like a typical heart where, you know, there's movies that try to put heart into them, but they're just trying to teach you boring lessons and they're not they're not going this deep. You know what I mean? No, there, there's so much subtlety in this movie that you're if you're not paying attention to it, you're not going to catch on it. But for me, I had the advantage of fresh eyes, right? I wasn't watching this movie with like a nostalgic feel like I often do with some, you know, 80s and 90s movies. So for me, I saw this completely different than probably most people do. I can see that. 
So Fred tells her she has to go back alone. You know, he says, you've got you back and you don't need me, which is pretty cool, right? So basically he says, yeah, you're in control of yourself. You've got, you know, you know you've got this. And he disappears. And then the surrealist scene ends and she wakes up on the floor where she fell in the kitchen and she goes back to making the salad in the kitchen, which seemed a little strange to me, but it is what it is. And then you kind of move along to start the final resolution of the movie, right? You start wrapping up because she's had the epiphany moment. The climax has happened of her working through her deepest issues with Fred and he's there to back her up. So Annabella hangs up on Charles kind of going wild here right because essentially he's being a dick and saying you know yeah i want you as this you know i control lizzie she's my side piece but i want you around too and she says no hangs up on him so yeah uh, then lizzie goes and dumps the salad on his head and then the best part of that you know he's always calling fred was always calling her snot face so she digs a booger out of her face or out of her nose and wipes it on charles's face yeah well fred pretty badass fred used to do that to her too he does it at the beginning of the movie when she's a kid and stuff. Okay, so I, that's something I missed there. But yeah, so she wipes the booger on Charles's face, which cracked me up. Yeah. And then she takes off in his Jaguar. <laughs> she goes to her mom's house and picks up the Fred box. And, you know, Charles calls her there and her mom's like trying to be supportive of Charles and like keep her in a bad spot, right? Two manipulative people would work well together to continue to manipulate somebody. Yep. So instead of even talking to him, she just hangs up the phone. And then this is like where it gets really another level of in-depth stuff, right? Because the mom, again, is blaming her for all this shit that happened in her childhood, right? So she basically admits that she had her child. She had Lizzie to save her marriage. And she said, instead of making things better, you made things worse. He directly, or she directly says, he left because of you. And is like losing her shit. And Lizzie, at this point, has already had her moment of... I'm not going to put up with that anymore. She's made her stance, so... Yeah. Um, she starts walking out the door, and then the mom yells, Don't you dare walk out on me. I'll be lonely. <laughs> and then she turns around and, like, has a moment, hugs her mom, kisses her on the face, and tells herself to go get herself... I don't know if she said friend or a Fred. Why don't you go get yourself a Fred? Friend, I'm not sure exactly what it was. Either way, it makes sense. Right. So then she goes to see her old childhood friend and asked her to be and she asks or he asks her just to like to keep her as an option right you know so now that she's single she's sorting through things on her own yeah. so you see his kid which he'd mentioned earlier in the film and the friend's daughter is outside playing with drop dead fred yep and you see lizzie kind of carrying on with it and you know basically fred's got a new purpose and then you see this nanny decides to quit, and then she gets, like, trapped in, like, a little leg rope and gets pulled up pulled up the tree there, so. Yeah. <laughs> kind of an interesting ending, and you wind up seeing the little girl doing a pinky promise to an invisible Fred at that point. So, the ending to me, is like, threw me off a little bit. That's the, one of the things I liked the least about it, was that ending. I thought they could have cut it off sooner. Because really, there's only a few moments where this guy is from the past, right? I think he serves, I think he is in that movie just to serve for this ending, just to show that Fred's past, you know, Fred's still there. Yeah. But the only thing that got me on this is like, okay, right, so when you see Fred there, what kind of trauma is this kid having that she needs Fred in her life? Pretty much. Right, because typically, typically what you see in this movie is that Fred's been manifested to help He's a coping mechanism, right? And you see that with the other kids when you see them at the doctor's office earlier. For sure. So, to me, like that was a way darker ending than what it needs to be from my perspective. Now, for most people, you're just giggling and funny because you're like, oh, okay, so there's, you know, Fred something else. And it almost kind of leaves it to like, oh, we could do a sequel with Fred being around with somebody else. But I took it at the darker way, but that's just my opinion. So, I think, uh, what are your... I think it would have been better off ending when... Uh she leaves her mother. Just the scene before that, you know? Yeah, I thought that would have been a good ending, or even a good ending would have just been like, she wipes the booger on his face and walks out, right? Because you kind of end on a funny, light-spirited moment, but, you know, they wanted that resolution with the mom, too. Yeah. Yeah, wipes the booger on his face, takes his Jaguar and drives off. That would have been a good ending, too. 
So I guess when this movie came out, right, because this is very early in the 90s, was it 91, I think? Something like that? Yeah. With that being said, I think we should uh, move on. We got three more segments to get through. So, with that being said, let's go to Six Sad World. I mean, are all your friends Satanists? A young Frenchman photographed this flying saucer, or is it? From a Do you believe in UFOs, astral projections, mental telepathy, ESP, clairvoyance, spirit photography? We're discussing Satanism and the occult this morning and some of the dangers. Telekinetic movement, full trance mediums, the Loch Ness Monster, and the theory of the land. For the purposes of this study, we will focus on the number 666. Tonight on Six Ed World. All right, so Six Ed World this week, we got a couple of uh, small topics we're going to try to get through real quick because they aren't too big. But uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on some of these, Justin. Uh, so the, uh, Jim Baker, he's a televangelist in uh, Missouri. He's being sued for selling a uh, fake coronavirus cure now. Which, I don't know if you saw this a couple weeks ago and stuff, when it was uh, first being a thing in the USA. He was on TV selling this shit. It's like a blue and silver bottle. It's a silver solution. So you're like drinking what looks like silver fucking paint. And um, he's trying to sell it on the air. And um, they were saying, it hasn't been tested on this strain of coronavirus, but it has been tested on another coronavirus strain. And it... uh, Kills it within 12 hours. It eliminates it. They were selling this fucking bottle for $80. And they're getting sued by the state of Missouri now. <laughs> then they also issued... As they should, right? Yeah, hell yes. That's, I mean, that's messed up, man. Like, you're abusing your power for there, right? Like, I get that you... I get that as a religious entity, they may want to try to bring people hope. Uh, that doesn't work for me, though. I think that's really messed up that they're trying to capitalize on that, right? For sure. I saw a really hilarious and, and bit. Just, you, no, go ahead. I was going to say, you're just you're just putting people at risk, right? Because you're giving them a, a false sense of hope. It just, like, it just reminds me of all the people that went out on Easter, right, and went all these churches and stuff. It's like, we have technology. You don't need to go gather right now. Like, there's way easier ways to do this and do what you need to do. Like, don't go being a bozo the clown about it. Yeah, the FDA has, um, for over 10 years, they've recommended not using any sort of silver solution because it's dangerous to your health, not good for you. <laughs> and I um, saw a yeah. really hilarious bit on John Oliver the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago, when he was talking about it. I think it was even before most lockdowns were happening that this was going on, really. Um, but the, the suing is an update on it. But he was talking about, okay, so... This is silver. Silver doesn't kill coronavirus. You know what it kills? Werewolves. So tonight I'm going to offer you the John Oliver Premium Werewolf Solution for $49.99 a bottle. It has millions of microscopic werewolves that will bite and infect your coronavirus, and then the silver will actually be effective. And I was laughing my ass off during that. Yeah, you just got to let that stuff be silly sometimes, man. Like, that's just a prime example of people taking advantage of people older down. And the people who are going to pay that guy for that kind of money are the people that don't have the money to spare. That's the most saddest part of that, right? Exactly. The people that's that are gullible so enough much... to believe it aren't necessarily gullible because they're just, you know, assholes. They're just fucking ignorant to this guy's stuff. They are probably a lot of old Christians. Not even old, but uneducated too, right? It's totally got Cousin Eddie vibes because, you know, he's talking about, oh, I wish we hadn't sold that, sent all that money to that televangelist on TV. Yeah. Well, what about the kids? Oh, his kids, what the hell? They could be fun. And he's like, no, your kids. <laughs> yeah. That's totally what I was thinking of the whole time you said that, right? Just people with good heart or good intentions are, are spending money that they shouldn't be spending on this. And it's like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, it sucks. You, you kind of are like... You think they're morons, but then you feel bad for them. It's just the whole thing. But um, absolutely. Then uh, to- so I guess we gotta today. They also opened the beaches in Florida. Yeah, let's uh, everyone pull a Jaws mayor, right? I've seen all those memes going around. I know it's just it's really hilarious to me that it's literally not even like before. It was you would see dr- memes about it in the country, and then you saw a few for the Florida when they weren't keeping them open before 
But it's just funny that it's actually a beach. That's what makes it so goddamn funny, because in Jaws, they open the beach. But in reality, this isn't funny, because I saw pictures today, and the beaches are fucking crowded there. And I don't think all of the beaches are open. There's only certain places. But the schools aren't open in Florida, and the governor's not opening schools. Pretty sure you can't get an abortion, but you can go to the beach. It's a bunch of just weird yeah, it's shit. Just over the top, man. It's just, yeah. It's a perfect segment for Sick Sad World, because that's what it is. It's like, you live in Florida, you can go to the beach anytime. Let's get over this stuff, let's get moved past it, then you can go back to the beach. Yeah. The beach is still going to be there when this is all said and done. But you may not be. People you care about may not be, if you go around living a pompous and arrogant lifestyle thinking that you're immune to this. Right. Like, I don't know if I'd get through it or not. Don't want to. That's right. So, let's uh, let's get moving along here. Let's get right into the top five here, because we're pushing what we're, we're aiming for in our time here, so. Yeah. Top five. Top, top, top five. Top five. Top, top, top five. 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 This is top five. All right. Top five film scores this week. That's what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with mine number five. If you don't know what this segment is, we just talk about our top five, whatever the hell. This week it's film scores. Um, we What we do is we don't, we don't try to do a bunch of research for it. We just try to go off the top of our heads. We usually make a list and then we decide our top five of them. And uh, we just go back and forth. We start at five, and then we go down the list. So I'll start. Uh, this week, my number five is the score for Scarface by Giorgio Mortar. Um, nice. There's definitely some iconic moments in that. I can see why you chose that. It. Um, he did Midnight Express as well, but this movie specifically, the score is just fucking sick. There's no other way to describe it other than sick. Uh, Scarface, everybody loves Scarface. And if you don't, I don't know I don't know why you don't, but that score is great. Um, the only song on it that I can think of is Push It to the Limit, and that's not part of the score, but the rest of it, like the opening and the beginning and the ending and then the big climactic scene, all those score during those is really, really perfect. So that's my top. Or, uh, that's my number five. Awesome. Mine's a little bit more predictable, but it's the original Back to the Future score, and as a kid, I remember listening to the music score cues in that, and that being like the first time I paid attention to anything like that, right? Because when I was watching Back to the Future, I hadn't seen Star Wars yet. I didn't really see Star Wars until a little bit, little bit later on, because neither of our parents were into it, so I didn't get into Star Wars until you know I had friends around, so... Right. That was one of the first ones I listened to, and uh, I definitely loved how even some of the most iconic parts of that score were actually revived for when the composer Alan Silvestri actually scored uh, Ready Player One as well, and then some of those scenes where they're referencing Back to the Future, he's kind of got a few of his own music cues, his nods to himself in there, which is pretty cool. Yeah. What's your number four? Number four, I got... Something by Danny Elfman. And, um, it's Beetlejuice. Um, I, I decided, I had to pick, because I want, I didn't want to have it all be, you know, a bunch of Danny Elfman. I love Danny Elfman stuff, uh, but, you know, I had to go with Beetlejuice. Uh, I just love it. It's fucking iconic. Very close to being on my list. But I went with a different one instead, but I definitely highly considered Beetlejuice on there because it's, you know, like you hear that music and you're immediately in, in the movie watching those scenes. Yeah. Beetlejuice is one of those one of those that I don't ever remember watching Beetlejuice for the first time. It's I've always watched it since I was young, so it's always been in my head. Yeah, that's a good point. That's definitely one of those that I don't remember. Like the first time I sat down to watch it, I just remember, you know, just watching it regularly. Yep. What do you got for four? So my number four is, again, Alan Silvestri, but this time for the Avengers, uh, the MCU stuff, right? I love I love what he did, something something different there, right? So that first Avengers, some of those cues, even hearing him over and over again, because he's done actually a significant amount of work for the MCU, but I just really, really dig those and how it came out. Yeah. 
so good at making you feel like certain emotions and triumphant and heroic. And you're like, man, how do you, the ability to express like those types of emotions through music is pretty incredible to me. For sure. I, uh, I, I can so, see that. That was a good one. For, uh, so what's your number three? Number three, I got Taxi Driver by Bernard Herrmann. Uh, Taxi Ooh, that's Driver. A good one. Every time I start it up, that's one of those movies that I love sitting through the opening credits for, for the music and the vibes that it instills in you. That it is. It's one of the older, like, 70s. It doesn't just sound like a typical soundtrack. It has a lot of weird drums going on and a lot of, like, jazzier elements. And it really just reminds you of a grimy New York City. So it's it's perfect. What do you got for number three? Yeah, that's three? a good choice. I haven't seen that enough to know that that's, uh, score that well. But my number three, originally I wrote down Beetlejuice. But right before we started recording, I said, you know, I'm actually changing one of mine. Right. And I changed it to Batman 89. Um, for me, watching the intro credits to that movie with the score going and like you see like everything kind of panning around through the Batman logo that you wind up finding out is the Batman logo. Yeah. I mean, amazing. Like it always puts you in that feeling like you're always back into that moment. It always feels like you're watching it for the first time when I see the beginning of that movie. Yeah, and without really, a doubt. I love that one. I, I so, was uh, but, debating that, Spider-Man or Beetlejuice, because Danny Elfman did all three, the first Spider-Man. Yeah, no, Danny Elfman is definitely one of my top composers yeah. for film scores. I love his work. So for my number two, I have something you probably haven't seen, I don't think, but we might have to expose you to it at some point. Uh, Suspiria. The soundtrack is done by Goblin, or the score. Um, Goblin's a band, I guess, but the soundtrack or score, depending on how you look at it, it's not actually... It is a score. There's no words or anything over them. But it's so different. It's a lot of synthesizers mixed with real instruments. Um, it's like an audio engineering masterpiece. Weird. So vibes. it's not like your typical orchestral. No. Film score. It's something a little different, unique. Yeah. yeah I could. I could vibe that. I like that. Um, has a little bit of like, the main theme kind of sounds like The Exorcist or something like that. You know, it has some bells and stuff. But there's also lots of weird drums, lots of world instruments, and chanting and stuff in it. So. Very cool. What do you got for number two? So my number two, when I think about movies. It like give you a feeling. Um, I will tell you the composer first before I tell you the film. So the composer is Elmer Bernstein, and if you think I'm just automatically going to say Ghostbusters, you're wrong. While I do appreciate his score for Ghostbusters, I think I'm... I absolutely love the score he did for Stripes. I was going to say it's Stripes, isn't it? Because I know he did the, both of those. Yeah, it's so iconic. It's so like uplifting. It's kind of got that military bit to it, right? So you hear some of like the marching style drums kind of mixed in there, all the horns and everything. Yeah, I, I love that one. Really, just sticks with me every time I see it, right? So, hell yeah, amazing stuff. My number one is number a one. film done by uh, Ennio Morricone. If you know who that is. He's done a lot of films. Everything from Hateful Eight to The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly to this movie, which is John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, nice. That's a good choice. Um, Ennio Morricone did like... <clears throat> a lot of those old Western movies, spaghetti Westerns like that. Um, if you don't know, like the little old jingle, what has it go like? Wah, wah, wah. That's him. That's oh, very. Cool. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think. So, um, he did this, and then later on, just an interesting factoid about it. Uh, Ennio Morricone was asked to score *Hateful Eight, and *Hateful Eight was heavily inspired by the thing, and actually, obviously, features Kurt Russell, 
but he used a lot of unfinished music pieces that he wrote for the thing and stuff they didn't use in the movie. They used in Hateful Eight. That's actually pretty awesome to, to see things get reused like that. So yeah. What do you got? Number one is by one of the most iconic film composers ever. And you could easily place a handful of his here for a lot of people's number one. Um, it's by none other than John Williams. Let me guess. Let me guess. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Bingo. Oh, so you two, uh, you two uh, dig, up, uh, dig up dinosaurs. No. <laughs> I was so close to putting it on my list. Tell me what it means for you. Jurassic Park, man. I love that movie so much. It's one of my favorites. There's just so many good things about it. But that score is so iconic. I mean, every time I feel it, because it has such soaring highs, but then it's also got such dark, deep, scary lows in there, right? It's got everything. So um, start to finish, I love everything about it. It's not just like the main score theme. It's like the overall there's some really good stuff when there's scary things going on in the background. On the background, so uh, highly recommend listening to the whole thing without the movie in place. So this is one that I own. And I can like just throw the CD in or stream it on uh, Apple Music and just love every second of it because it's just everything you want in a film score: happy, sad, scary, dark, humorous tones. Like it really fits the. I mean. It just truly makes you appreciate why John Williams is the way he is, because he can just master your emotions so easily <laughs> with music. Why don't you explain to me why John Williams is the way he is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. A little twister action for you. Uh, yeah. So that... It's the extreme! <laughs> the extreme! Uh, there was an evil Bill, and I, I killed him. <laughs> Chucks the bottle. Never even hits. So uh, that's top five for this week. Hit us up with your top five film scores on any of our social media accounts. Let us know what yours is. Uh, let us know what top five you want to hear in the future. You know, let us know. With that Remember, being said, no research. The only research you can do is to look up the composer name if you don't know it. What top five movies come to your mind, the scores that you absolutely love, and why? That's true. I did have to look up the Taxi Driver... Uh, score. I didn't know his name. I knew all the other ones, though. Good stuff. Alright. Last one up. Happy anniversary. So, happy anniversary this week. We chose a movie that released on the 25th day of the fourth month of the 1,980th year. And this movie is Where the Buffalo Roam, starring Bill Murray as Hunter S. Thompson. Now, not nearly as well done as Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, it still has its moments. For sure. So why don't you tell me what your favorite moments are? What what stands out to it about you, Alec? Well, all right. Let me start off here. Neil Young. The movie opens up with Where the Buffalo Roam, done by Neil Young. He does the score for this movie. And it's actually a pretty dope opening sequence. I really like it. Just like I like the opening sequence for Fear and Loathing. I'm going to try to avoid talking about Fear and Loathing, but it's hard not to compare it to it. But uh, you also got Peter Boyle in this movie with... Uh, who plays Laszlo, which is basically the same character that Benicio del Toro is playing in the other movie. Uh, there are different names and stuff, but so it the opens. Lawyer, essentially, yeah. yeah. It opens and he goes into his house in Corala, uh, Colorado. He's drinking and he's writing, and uh, as he's writing, he goes back. It kind of flashes back to him doing other stuff, right? But before it flashes back, there's like an alarm goes off and he starts yelling and firing his gun in his house. Uh, I noticed that his attack dog will bite people in the balls when he says Nixon. And he has like a stuffed dummy there, you know, with Nixon's face over it. And he says... Yeah, with the mask on it, yeah. Yeah. 
So then so he a uh, couple other cool things in that opening sequence, right? Once you get to him in his um, in his house, right? Well, everyone knows like, oh, we can't stop here. This is a bad country. Right. Well, one of the things, zooming in down to see Hunter S. Thompson at the typewriter, you see like a large stuffed bat hanging like right above his desk, and then it pans down to Bill Murray sitting there as Hunter typing away while he's drinking uh, wild turkey. That's his his drink of choice. You know, you see it quite a few times in the movie. Yeah. So then they kind of do the flashback, and he's at the mental hospital, basically, and he's been banging a nurse in there, and his ho- his room's just trashed, and he's, like, talking into a tape recorder. There's a wild turkey that's turned upside down, and instead of an IV drip, it's dripping, and he has it taped next to his mouth. And uh, Yeah, so one thing I think people forget a lot about this movie is that you know, Johnny Depp is very iconic as Hunter S. Thompson. You know, it's famously known that he moved in there to live with them to pick up his mannerisms. But Bill Murray picked up the mannerisms very well. Oh, yeah. Bill Murray um, does in just the opening as good of sequence, an impression. In the opening sequence, I took note that, like, he didn't sound like him as much. But then when it comes back to it, like, you know, he starts sounding like him a little bit more, the way he mumbles and talks fast and, and all that. So oh, yeah. Bill does a pretty damn good job of that, too. And, right, and this is a movie that... Overall, the script isn't amazing, but he does a good job of Hunter S. Thompson. I think this movie just skips around a little too much. Um, For sure. You know, there's kind of different different pieces of books and stories and things that kind of weave their way in and out of this, right? And the pacing's just not there. Um, you don't feel some of the same tension that you feel if you've seen Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Right. Um, it has one of Hunter S. Thompson's quotes that he uh, supposedly actually gave at a college when he said, in my case, you know, I hate to advocate drugs or liquor or violence or insanity to anyone, but in my case, it's worked. Yes, that's a very famous famous line of his, right? So yeah, he's a very quotable author. So watching the movie, like, it's hard to get through all the way just because, like I said, there's some pacing issues and things like that. The acting is well done, but I think the script's what's limited in here, right? And then... The, the directing lack of yeah and i would say it's just a lack of focus on like what the overall story is right for I sure mean, they almost could have done it just a short tv series or a mini series where they had bill doing this just to get like little snippets of what was going on with hunter s thompson at the time right um you know it's it's a fun movie it's definitely one of those things where you're not getting a usual bill murray right because Bill Murray is usually just himself, and this is like the one one of the few times where like Bill Murray is truly character acting, which he didn't. He, you know, he doesn't do a lot. So I thought it was pretty fun to rewatch it and just kind of see his take on it. Well, what's funny and, about this is, watch this, then go watch Caddyshack, and tell me he's not still being Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah, ex- except he's got a character voice for. Carl Spackler, right? I mean, it's a little so different, but it's still based off of his, I feel like, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, you can tell that, right? And I think he spent a little time with Hunter S. Thompson, too. Yeah, he was even wearing the that hat role. around in that movie. Oh, yeah, so I think it, no, it was, it was, it was fun, but it's not perfect, right? Yep. The rewatchability on it's not very high, but if you want to see Bill Murray in a good role in a bad movie, I would say that's one of them. Yeah, Bill Murray's an actor I'll watch in anything, so it's still not a bad movie. It's a, it's a, it's good to watch it at least once, you know. I'm not saying you'll fall in love with it, but if you haven't seen it and you like Fear and Loathing or Bill Murray, watch it. Absolutely. All right, I guess we'll start wrapping things up here this week. Um, thanks again for listening to everything we talk about this week. Uh, remember to hit us up on our social media accounts. We have Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. We're on Spotify, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitcher, Apple Podcasts. If we're not on something that you prefer to listen to us on, let us know. We'll try to get it out on there. You gotta do the radio guy voice. If we're not on your favorite streaming format, please reach out and let us know by calling us at twitter.com. We don't have a phone number yet. We'll Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Monster Truck Rally this Sunday. Blah, blah, blah. Monster Truck Jam 2020. Frog Brothers, Frog Brothers, Frog Brothers. Podcast this Sunday. The 
Frog Brothers Podcast returns next Saturday to a movie theater near you. <laughs> you sound like Liam Neeson. We'll just be hanging out in front of a movie theater next week. Actually, we should each respectively go record at a movie theater just for the nostalgia feel of what it was like when those places were open. Right. We are hundreds of miles apart. I think we're about 400 miles apart, typically, is what it is actually driving. Yeah. And I would walk 400 miles, and I would walk 500 more. more Just to see you in person so we could podcast for another day. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's kind of actually weird. I'm just staring at, like, blinds while we record this usually and talking to you. I got my notes in front of me and stuff, but I need to make it prettier in here. Yeah, I've got books in front of me, a whole slew of books. I got some oh, extreme sure Ghostbusters paintings I did on the wall. A Camp Crystal Lake flag. And another painting I did with a VHS hanging off of it. And that's what I'm looking at. Other than the fucking wall. So. Well, good time. So, hope you guys are enjoying your quarantines. And uh, we'll talk to you next weekend. Yeah. Hit us up online on Facebook. Let us know what you guys think. Look out on our uh, YouTube this week, too. We may have some uh, exclusive YouTube content coming out before the next podcast. Maybe, maybe not. Take a look. It's my birthday on Monday, so if I get anything good in the mail, yeah, it's also, I might make a video of me opening it. It's also, as everybody likes to point out, 420 and Hitler's birthday and the Columbine anniversary on your birthday. Hey, there's a lot of... Much cooler people than Hitler that share my birthday. So look up the celebrities that have my birthday and feel better about it. I tell you what, it's 420. That's all that matters to me. Fuck your birthday. <laughs> well, we don't all get to share our birthday with the state of Kansas, Alec. So and Oprah why don't you Winfrey can enjoy that one. At Astra per Aspera. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. Bye. These are my dinner guests, the Frog Brothers. Frog Brothers, Frog Brothers. These are my dinner guests, Frog Brothers. Frog Brothers, Frog Brothers. These are my dinner guests, the Frog Brothers. Frog Brothers, Frog Brothers. These are my dinner guests, Frog Brothers. Frog Brothers, Frog Brothers. These are my dinner guests, the Frog Brothers.